morning and welcome home to Grace Avenue United Methodist Church. It's wonderful to be with you today, wherever you are on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, it's wonderful to be together and to take time now to uh, give our full attention to the worship of Almighty God. Today we're going to continue our series called Off Limits. We, each week we are looking at uh, one of the Gospels, one of the four Gospels. Last week we studied Luke. Today we're going to study John and a particular important passage from John chapter 8. We're so thankful that you are with us and that you are making space wherever you are today uh, for us to come in and to be with you. We do hope you'll take a moment and register your attendance today, either on the live stream or through Facebook Live. Please let us know you're out there. It is so important for us to know and have that connection. Uh, There are going to be some times during the service where we're going to ask you to participate in the chat, so be ready to do that. But but register your attendance. Uh, We have another gift for you this week, and the way we'll be able to get that to you is to know that you have registered in some way this morning. So please take time to let us know you're out there, and uh, we'll look forward to making a delivery to you this week of something that I think is really special special. If you're a guest with us, we are so thankful that you've tuned in today wherever you are, and we'd love to hear from you and know more about you and uh, find out how we can be in ministry and in relationship with you. So if you're a guest, if you wouldn't mind sending a quick note to Danielle at graceavenue.org, she would love to take your information and also give you a little bit more information about our church. We're really thankful you are with us today. There are so many of us on staff that would love to connect with you, whether you're a guest or a member looking for a way for a deeper connection. And we have those across the age levels. So feel free to email laura at graceavenue.org. That would be me. Or know that for children's ministry, Brittany Board would love to be able to hear from you. Sarah Roseman would love to be able to hear from you about youth ministry. And Kristen Lane continues to connect so many of our adults in small groups as well. Mary Martin also continues to connect us with missions as we reach out to the community. So there is a place for you to get connected. And those can be virtual groups or we also are beginning to have some in-person groups. And so know that wherever you are in your place and what you're looking for, we want to be able to connect with you. We are all connecting as we gather and worship, studying the Gospels. And we're encouraging everybody to read the four Gospels during this 31 days of October. Last week, we began by focusing on the Gospel of Luke. Now, if you didn't get to read Luke, what I'm going to tell you is that's okay. You can read that again. You can catch up with that at the end. But this week, we want you to focus on the Gospel of John. We want during this week for you to sort of read some chapters each and every week so that we move through that together. And as we all focus on John, we just believe that right now we are absorbing so much stuff, including so much news about different things. And wouldn't it be good for our souls to sink into the scripture right now? It's okay to turn off the TV, to turn off some of the computers, to turn off all the news sources And just to sink in to Jesus' words during this time period. Now when you read it, our invitation is for you to read it as a narrative. Don't spend all your time jumping back and forth to the footnotes. Just read the gospel. And let the stories just fill your soul. This coming Wednesday, Laurie Hanson Roberts and Billy and I will be back in this space and we'll be doing an interactive chat, talking a little bit deeper about the Gospel of John. And so we would love for you to join us on the live stream or Facebook Live and know that that's a time for you to bring your questions. So as you read, make notes, underline things, really you know, the Bible's meant to be used. And so it's one of those where we want you to make notes and to ask us questions or to let us know your favorite stories, to let us know what surprises you, what comforts you, what challenges you as we sink into that. And it's also a great opportunity for us right now because it's one of those where we're not only encourage all of our youth and adults to read the Gospels, but this coming weekend, we are gonna be celebrating third grade Bibles. Now, many of you may have received a third grade Bible when you were, well, many years ago for us. But it's one of those where we are handing out third grade Bibles to all of the third graders in our community. And some of you may say, well, but 
I haven't really joined Grace Avenue. That's okay. We want to make sure that we get this third grade Bible so that our children immerse themselves in the scripture as well. Now, Brittany Board can answer any of your questions. You can also go online and sign up for a specific time frame where the third grader can receive their Bible. And then we are going to celebrate that during our time of worship next Sunday as well. Finally, we continue to reach out to the community. And it has been a tradition of our church for over 16 years to have a pumpkin patch for our community. And we really struggled with whether we were going to be able to do that this year. Well, we have figured out a way with Pumpkins USA and the Navajo farmers to be able to get the pumpkins loaded on pallets so that we can unload them with forklifts this year. I'm going to miss all the team so much who come and help us. But we're going to get them all unloaded safely out in the patch so that next weekend on the 17th, we will open the patch to our community in a safe way. Everybody's going to be encouraged to wear a mask. We're going to encourage social distancing. But you can come out and take pictures. They're going to be the photo ops. We need your help, though. If you are willing to come and to welcome others onto our property, please go online and sign up as a volunteer. There's a space to do that, a sign-up genius, and we need your help to be able to welcome others. Know that we are going to do this in as safe a way as possible. And so it's all about your comfort level with that. We don't want to ask anybody to do anything they're not comfortable with. But it is something that's good to my heart to see the windmill back up out in the patch. And so if you haven't driven by, drive by just to see the windmill. And we are so excited about all that lies ahead for us as we continue in the month of October. And one of the things that continues is in-person communion services. And so also go online to find out more about that. The word gospel literally means good news. And so I invite us now to sink into the good news that is ours through Jesus Christ today. We'll do that by preparing our hearts for worship. Take your candle out and light that candle and be reminded of God's presence in your midst. Know that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. That's actually found in our scripture today. And so get your Bible out uh, at the end of our scripture. Uh, And so get your Bible out today and turn to John chapter 8. We're going to read verses 2 through 11. Verses 2 through 11 of John chapter 8 as we go to the gospel of John today. And now let's prepare our hearts and our minds for a time of praising God together. Good morning. It is so good to be with you this morning. We are going to open with the hymn, See the Morning Sun Ascending. It's a great hymn to open our worship. It's a great hymn to open any day. So let us stand as you are able, embody your spirit, and sing together. Oh, no. 
would take this time to turn with those who are with you in your home and pass the peace of Christ and maybe text someone, email someone, give someone a phone call and let them know that the peace of Christ is with them. all the children to gather around and Brittany Board will come and do our children's time. Good morning, friends. So today we have a special reading corner that we have to get to. And while you're not here in person for us to move together, I want you to stand up. And that's children of all ages. So zero to 99 if you want to participate. And because our pumpkins are coming in about a week, I'm super excited because I've never gotten to experience that before. We're going to pretend that we have a wheelbarrow, okay? And we're going to hold it, and it's full of pumpkins, and we're going to drive it around our room and drive it around our room. Go back and forth and maybe in a circle and drive. Awesome. Now, I have arrived at our reading corner for today. And so, if you were here with me, I'd have you scoot close. So, I want you to scoot up close to the screen, not too close because I don't want you to hurt your eyes. Okay? And we're going to read a story together called If Kids Ran the World that my friend Kristen Lane gave to me. Are you ready? If kids ran the world, we would make it a kinder, better place. Maybe we'd run the world in a big tree house and everybody would be welcome. We take care of the most important things. We know people are hungry, so all over the world, everyone would have enough to eat. The food would taste delicious, and it would make people healthy and strong. Kids who had extra food would help bring it to people who needed it. Everyone would have a safe place to live. Bad housing would be fixed, and new housing wouldn't ruin the land or sea. No matter how sick people were, they would have the medicine they needed. If you were lonely in a hospital, kids would come visit you and let you play with pets. Somebody friendly would help you with a big smile. Everyone would laugh a lot more. Kids would have more picnics and games and funny books and movies. People would spend more time playing and less time worrying. No bullying would be allowed. You could climb trees or dress up and dance and sing just for fun. Fun. Kids could act very silly. All children would go to good schools where every teacher was nice and had lots of books, music, and art. Classes would be exciting and fun. Schools would serve yummy meals and have great sports and big playgrounds. Kids would love school. People could wear any kind of clothes and no one would tease them. Children would all live with people who loved them. More forests would be planted and protected. All the beaches, pools, and parks would belong to everyone. There would be no clubs or places that kept some people out. Friendship, kindness, and generosity would be worth more than money. People would take care of the planet and animals and plants. 
Nobody would throw trash on the ground or in the ocean or make the air dirty. People would have religious freedom and nobody would punish them or call them names. Everyone would learn the happiness of being thankful. Even if they were busy, people would remember to stop to see the beauty of a sunset or a rainbow. All over the world, people would feel safe with one another. People would live in peace together. No more hate. Everybody would learn how to forgive. If kids ran the world, would these things be possible? Yes, we think so, because kids know that everyone can learn to share. Kids know how to try to do their very best, and kids know that the most important thing in the world isn't money or being king or queen or pushing other people around. It's love, giving it, sharing it, showing it. And that's why if kids ran the world, we'd make it a wonderful place for everyone to live, grown-ups too. If peace begins with a smile, then children are our greatest hope for the future. So I wanted to share this book with you today because I just want you to remember how special you each are, how every one of you is a child of God and loved. And this story just really spoke to me this week. And just remember how amazing you are and how loved you are, okay? Can you do that? Awesome. Now let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear gracious God, thank you for all your love. Help me to always remember I am not alone. You are with me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, one of the things that I truly miss is seeing our children run up to the Jesus or just generosity jug because they have that heart for giving fully of themselves. I love the image of if, if children ran the world, how we could live in that sense of generosity and peace. In John's gospel, that's exactly what Jesus talks about over and over again. It's in John's gospel that is the I am statements. I am the vine, you are the branches. It's in John's gospel that I am the light of the world. And so it's one of those where we continue in the midst of this time period to know that our offering that we make continues to shine the light of Christ in all of the world. So as we make our offering, you can do that by text. You can do that by bringing it by the church to the entryway. You can mail it in. You can go online today and offer your gifts that continue to shine Christ's light into all of the world. And so as we offer our gifts, Laurie Hanson Roberts once again shares the gift of her music and it was Laurie's birthday yesterday, and so we celebrate to that as well as we hear her proclaim God's word in song. Sorrow's edge 
life's beauty seems to find your love in everything. I've come to trust the hope it brings to find your love in everything. And even as I fall apart, even through my shadow, Catch your smile on someone's face, amazing grace. I've carried this burden for too long. I have turned from you, and my heart has turned to stone. You say your yoke is easy, yet I carry it still. You say your burden is light, yet I carry it still. You say you will give me rest, yet I carry it still. Lower my vengeance, my anger, and my hatred, and banish my wicked thoughts from me. Send down a drop from heaven of your Holy Spirit to soften this heart of rock of mine. Give me the strength to let go. Let my memory provide no shelter for grievance against another. Let my heart provide no harbor for hatred of another. Let my tongue be no accomplice in the judgment of a brother. Give me the strength to surrender. Give me the strength to be weak, to let go, and not pick it up again.
how quick we are to pick up the stones, how quick we are to be ready to, to cast those at someone, stones that condemn, stones of hatred, stones that then often build walls, stones of pride. How easy it is for us to pick up these stones of judgment. Stones that then set us apart from one another. And what does it mean for us if we begin to name the stones that we so often are willing to cast towards others? And in naming them, to lay them down. I know that, that these stones get heavy as we carry them. And so today, I, I ask you as we enter into this time of prayer, to think about what it means to open our hearts to God and to lay the stones down. Today, I need to lay down some stones. Stones of self-righteousness. Stones where I hold a grudge. I need to lay down a stone of anger. I need to lay down the stones of prejudgment. What stones do you need to lay down today? What stones do we need to be willing to place at the altar? You can name those in the chat, or you can just name them on your heart. But let us, let us begin to prayerfully consider what it means to lay down the stones that we have carried, the stones that we are so quick to pick up. Let us pray. Sometimes, oh God, we forget people or we toss them aside. The difficult ones, the needy ones, the ones that are hard to spend time with, the ones who confront us. And sometimes when we do things like that, it's really not about the other people but about us. We are uncomfortable or we feel guilty or we follow brighter, shinier people or we worry about what will make us look good. We are in such desperate need of your forgiveness. We need to be forgiven for our sin, for our mistakes for mistaking what the world values with what you value. Merciful God, you show compassion on all your children, leading them in grace and hope. Help us too, never to condemn, never to give up on people, but to be patient, understanding and forgiving. Help us to be better and help us to see more clearly and care more deeply. In the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen Well, I want to welcome you back to the exegesis corner. 
Uh, I had somebody in my family this week call me and say, I'd never heard that word before. What is exegesis? And that was a good point. So maybe I ought to just take a second to explain. Exegesis is the critical study of a text. It literally means to lead. And the idea here is, is that when you begin to examine all the things that make up a text, who wrote it, to whom it was it written, when was it written, what was the context, the text then can begin to lead you in certain ways. That's exegesis. And every week we think it's important, since we're studying these four Gospels, to take a moment and kind of just understand what the Gospels are about. This week we are at the Gospel of John, and we would refer to the Gospel of John as good news revealed. Now, there's some important things for us to understand about the Gospel of John. The first is, uh, it is purportedly written by a disciple of Jesus known as John. John's name is never mentioned uh, as the author in this Gospel, but you can read in the context those things. Uh, And John is, in this sense, the beloved disciple, or sometimes referred to in John as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, a lot of people contest whether the disciple John was actually the uh, uh, author or one of his close followers, but we'll call this the Gospel of John whenever we use it. It was written in probably about 95 AD, which makes it a little after the Gospel of Luke. Uh, And as such, it would be Uh, hard to believe that one of the followers of Jesus, one of his apostles, would still be alive uh, towards the end of the first century. Um, The gospel was written to a group of people who had basically been kicked out of their synagogue. These Jewish Christians, as well as some Gentiles, had uh, been expelled from their synagogue. We don't know why. Possibly this occurred in Ephesus, uh, which we know about from the book of Ephesians. Uh, But in the midst of this expulsion, one of the things that we get a lot of in the Gospel of John sometimes is sort of seen as anti-Semitism. You see some pretty critical stuff uh, about Jewish people in the Gospel of John. And we have to be very careful with all of that. But it was probably written in the context of a group of people who had been expelled from their synagogue and were pretty upset about that. We need to say that John is different from the other three Gospels. It is not a synoptic Gospel. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all very similar in that they share similar materials word for word. We talked a little bit about that last week. This is totally different with John. Uh, Although John has some of the same experiences, uh, he does not borrow the exact same language from Matthew, Mark, or Luke. It is not one of the synoptic gospels. And then the last thing we need to say about just this part is that uh, the writer John was very familiar with Greek philosophy. There's a lot of things here that kind of point uh, to that kind of understanding. Well, what were some of the themes of the Gospel of John that we need to take note of today as we prepare for this? Uh, The first one is that there is an extreme emphasis on a lot of binary contrast. John will talk about light and darkness. He will talk about heaven and earth, or what he really says is heaven and the world. Uh, He will talk and contrast flesh and the spirit, good and evil. You will find this binary contrast going on throughout the gospel of John. Secondly, it's important to understand that John really wants to focus on who Jesus is. Even more important than what Jesus does John wants to focus on the identity of who Jesus is. And that's why in John's gospel, you get these great I am statements. If you've ever thought about the great I am statements, there are at least seven in the gospel of John that we take note of. When Jesus says things like, I am the good shepherd, or I am the light of the world, or I am the resurrection and the life, all of these uh, are part of the way in which John wants to reveal who Jesus is. Very important in the Gospel of John, there are no parables like there are in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Instead, what we get in the Gospel of John are seven signs. Uh, These are sometimes seen as miracles, sometimes they're called wonders. But really, signs is the very best way to talk about it because what John wants to do is he shows these seven signs as basically using the word like we would use the word signature. These seven miracles that Jesus performs, like the feeding of the 5,000 in John's gospel, are Jesus' signature events. John tells us who Jesus is, 
And then we see a signature event that shows us uh, the very thing that John is trying to point out. And then the final thing we just need to say is that over a third of the gospel covers just the last week of Jesus' life. His entry into Jerusalem, his passion, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. Uh, is, it makes up more than a third, more than one third of all the gospel of John. And it's probably an important thing to keep in mind while you're reading it. The last thing I want to tell you is that uh, the gospel of John is written in editions. Just like a good book has a first edition and a second edition and a third edition. That is very true of many of the writings in the Bible. And it is especially true in John. The scripture that we're going to read today from John 8, for example, was not part of the first edition but was a later addition and and put in, but still very much part of the Gospel of John. Chapter 21 in John's Gospel is the same way. It is part of what what might be seen as a second, third, or fourth edition uh, that was added on to the Gospel of John. Nevertheless, these still make up very important parts of how we read and understand the Gospel of John. Now we'll turn to Bill Roberts, who will read our scripture today from John chapter 8. Our scripture reading this morning does come from the gospel according to John, chapter 8, verses 2 through 11. Early in the morning, he returned to the temple. All the people gathered around him, and he sat down and taught them. The legal experts and Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. Placing her in the center of the group, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone women like this. What do you say? They said this to test him because they wanted a reason to bring an accusation against him. Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground, with his finger. They continued to question him, so he stood up and replied, Whoever hasn't sinned should throw the first stone. Bending down again, he wrote on the ground. Those who heard him went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. Finally, only Jesus and the woman were left in the middle of the crowd. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Is there no one to condemn you? She said, no one, sir. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, don't sin anymore. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, inspire us with your true and lively word that we may know more of what it means to be your children, that we may faithfully respond to the call of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one in whose name we've gathered and the one in whose name we pray. Amen. I actually watched a little bit of college football yesterday, and as I did, I was reminded that Uh, college teams have some pretty crazy cheers and chants. For example, at the University of Arkansas, they literally call the hogs. And and you can go down to Old Miss and they'll give you a good hotty toddy, whatever that means. You can go over to TCU in Fort Worth and yesterday they were yelling, Riff Ram Bazoo. And then, of course, you can go up to the University of Kansas and get a good rock chalk Jayhawk. And then there are the Aggies. Oh, so many things about the Aggies. But I found that the Aggies have this very interesting concept of theology and salvation, I guess, because they are always wanting to B-T-H-O somebody. All this cheering and chanting kind of began to remind me a a little bit about uh, uh, when I was in school and thinking about some of the cheers we had. You ever thought about the cheers you had when you were in high school, some of those chants that you had? Uh, There's one that's really on my mind right now because it seems to depict the era that we're living in. See if you remember this cheer. Lean to the left, lean to the right, stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. Lean to the left, lean to the right, stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. 
That's a pretty good description of where we are right now, isn't it? Right? I turn on the TV. I watch political commercials. Lean to the left. Lean to the right. Stand up. Sit down. Fight, fight, fight. I watch a political debate. There was one last week. There might be another one coming soon. Lean to the left. Lean to the right. Stand up. Sit down. Fight, fight, fight. And this is just about all social media has become right now. Lean to the left. Lean to the right. Stand up. Sit down. Fight, fight, fight. You know, it's interesting because there is a very fine line between a cheering crowd and an angry mob. There's a fine line between a cheering crowd and a crowd that suddenly gets out of control and becomes an angry mob. We've seen that recently. And oh, I know some of you want to think this is off limits and we shouldn't be talking about it at church. This is the kind of thing Jesus needs us to invest our lives in for the sake of peace and justice. You know, the the history of angry mobs in the United States is is a very interesting one, particularly when we talk about things called hanging or lynchings. A lot of people don't remember that back in the early part of the 1800s, most of the people that were hanged were white men. They were outlaws. And a posse would be summoned and they would go out and they would would capture these outlaws who'd robbed a bank or maybe someone who had killed somebody. And they'd bring them back and have their own form of justice before any court of law. And they would be hanged throughout the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. It was many white men who were hanged. And then it all began to change after the Civil War because we know that starting after the Civil War in the 1870s, the people that started being hanged were people of color. And in particular, African Americans were told that from 1877 until about 1950, approximately 4,000 African Americans were lynched in this country. And not because they had robbed someone or not because they had killed someone, but most of the time just because of the color of their skin. And they had done something that was objectionable to somebody else in the white community. And because of those Jim Crow laws, they didn't wait. Instead, some kind of vigilante justice was carried out and they were hanged and lynched. There is a fine line between a cheering crowd and an angry mob. We find that in the scripture today. This scripture is, I think, one of the most remarkable of all scriptures that we have in terms of understanding the character of Jesus. That's why even though if it was a later edition, it belongs in the Gospel of John because it clearly reveals to us who Jesus is. Jesus was at the temple. He was sitting down. He was teaching people when suddenly a group of religious leaders storm into the midst of the crowd and they're dragging a woman with them. And they hurl this woman into the midst of the crowd right in front of Jesus. And they say to everyone present, this woman was caught in the act, in the act of adultery, violation of one of the Ten Commandments. And these religious leaders, the Pharisees, turn to Jesus and they say to him, the law of Moses requires that a person in this condition who has violated this law is to be stoned to death. What do you say? Now, never mind that they really kind of were a little misguided in the law because the law actually said that the woman and the man were to be brought before people and stoned to death. But they weren't really interested in the woman. You see, they weren't trying to embarrass the woman. They weren't trying to to do anything necessarily to the woman. The woman was just a prop to these Pharisees. What they really wanted to do was expose Jesus. They wanted to get the crowd to turn against Jesus. They wanted the crowd to stop cheering him and instead become an angry mob. And so they waited for him to answer. They waited to see if he too would follow the law and condemn this woman. Today we talk a little bit more in depth about Jesus and condemnation. 
And I think that's such an important topic that can't be off limits right now. In a world that is so filled with, with hatred and so filled with name calling and, and so filled with just outright condemnation. I think it's so important to look at the character and the nature of Jesus today and be reminded that the character of Jesus is not just for a select few, but it is, as we say earlier in the Gospel of John, God so loved the world that he sent his only son. What does it mean for us today? What does this story tell us about Jesus and condemnation? I think the first thing that it tells us this morning is that we need to take very careful note of how Jesus saves. We, we call Jesus Savior, and, and we need to take very special note of that. And I use that term very explicitly here because there's this very interesting part of the story today where when the Pharisees come with the woman and they, they bring her before Jesus and they demand that Jesus tell them what should be done, Jesus bends down in the ground and starts writing in the sand. It's very unusual. He, he, it's almost as if he wants to ignore the question, but no one has really been able to determine exactly why or what Jesus is writing. And yet I think there's something very important going on here that we need to, to take a closer look at today. Why was Jesus writing? Was he just trying to ignore the Pharisees, hoping they would go away? Or, or was he trying to take his time to come up with an appropriate answer? The, the scripture doesn't say. But there is something about writing here that is very important. And it's found in the Greek. And the Greek word for write is graphe or grapho. And yet that's not exactly what is used here. Instead, it's katagraphe. It's not simply write, but it is katagraphe. It is to write against. And I think one of the best explanations that I've seen that I, that I really kind of embrace today is this idea that what happened in that moment was that as they came and accused this woman, Jesus knelt down on the ground and started writing in the sand their sins. Pride, self-righteousness, selfishness, oppression of the poor. And I think that's what he was writing on the ground. But I think that's so important to take note of because that's how Jesus saves. He doesn't save with a stone. Now, we all say, but wait a minute. The, 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 the Ten Commandments were written on stone tablets. Aren't these laws written in stone? Yes. But the Ten Commandments were given as a gift to help us know how to live our lives. Jesus reminds us that when those are violated, those sins are written, yes, but they're written in sand. They're written on the ground because Jesus is there to see them also covered up and washed away. That's who Jesus is. He's the Savior. You ever gone out and written something on the sand of the beach? You go out and write something kind of funny or maybe it's something even kind of important? about somebody that you love, what you know is, is that before long, the shore's going to, the, the, the ocean's going to come up and it's going to wash all of that away. And the next day you'll go out and it's as if those words were never there. That's how Jesus approaches our sin. He looks at the Ten Commandments as a gift to us. He looks at the law as a gift to us. And then he writes down our sin. He takes note of our sin but then that sin is washed away. And what a gift that is for us today to come to that place where we understand that Jesus takes note of our sin, but he does not write it indelibly in stone. Jesus does not take the temptation to pick up the stone today to, to come and help entice the crowd to, to try to cause harm to this woman. Instead, Instead, he comes to that gracious moment. It's a reminder for us today that we know John 3.16 so well, but we've also got to remember John 3.17, which reminds us that for indeed God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, 
but that the world through him might be saved. Take note today of how it is that Jesus saves us. Our sins are not written in stone. Our sins are not condemned by stone. Instead, Jesus writes in the ground. And eventually, because of his love, it's all covered up and forgiven and goes away. And so that brings us to the next thing about Jesus and condemnation that we need to take into account today. And that is Jesus is inviting us to put down our spotlights. You know, when we don't want to deal with our sin, the the thing that we do is we pick up a spotlight. And that's what's going on in the scripture today. They shine a spotlight on the woman and they throw her in front of Jesus. And then they shine the spotlight on Jesus. And they want Jesus to be held accountable in that moment. Isn't that what we do so often as human beings? We don't want to admit or deal with our own stuff, so we're going to shine the spotlight on somebody else. We're going to criticize them. We're going to call them out. We're going to condemn them. And Jesus is so quick in this moment to take a moment and to look around. And he stands up from the ground and he says, okay, I'll tell you what. You want to shine the spotlight on this moment? You want to see this woman stoned to death? You want to see this woman condemned? Then here's what you do. Let the one of you who is blameless cast the first stone. Let the one of you who is blameless, let the one of you who is sinless cast the first stone. What a powerful, powerful way of identifying who he is, and what we should be about in our world today. The scripture goes on then to say something very impactful. It says, in that moment, they all left one by one, and the elders left first. They dropped their stones, and they began to walk away. They weren't an angry mob anymore. But it's interesting to me that the elders left first. You know, some of us who've had a lot of experience in life know the truth of this idea that none of us are blameless, that none of us really have the right to cast stones at anyone. And that's so powerful in terms of how we understand this condemnation today. And then there's this beautiful moment in the scripture where the crowd is dispersed And Jesus comes back to the woman. She's just been a pawn in this whole thing. But now Jesus does what he always does. He pays attention to her. He probably asks her her name. And he spends a moment with her. And he says to her, Woman, who is it now that condemns you? And she looks around and says, No one, sir. And then he says, Neither do I. In that moment, Jesus has made a second invitation, which I think is so critical. He has invited us to put down our spotlight and pick up a mirror. And he held up that mirror first to the crowd who then dispersed. But then he holds up that mirror to that woman, broken, hurt, sinful. And yet in that moment, Jesus invites her to look in the mirror And as he asks the question one more time, who condemns you? He offers the best news of grace that any of us could ever hear when we look in the mirror. The voice of a Savior saying, neither do I condemn you. And with mirror in hand, we swell up and we hear the words of Jesus when he offers us that new life. And he says, so now go and sin no more. He didn't let this woman off the hook. Instead, he offered her a new life. I think that's what Jesus does for every one of us. He tells us to put down our spots lights and pick up our mirrors and to recognize that we've got things in our lives that need to change, but we don't have to be condemned because of them. We can see them as an opportunity for new life and new life that comes to us through Jesus Christ. 
there's a fine line between a cheering crowd and an angry mob. And in the Gospel of John, that plays out much later as Jesus goes to the cross. Maybe this is a time in our lives where we need to put down the stones of condemnation and we need to see the cross for what it really, really is. The gift of a one who is the Savior of the world. Thanks be to God. In response to what we've heard and in response to who we are as God's children, I invite you to stand up and let us affirm our faith together. I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our closing song this morning is a, a modern song, Mighty to Save, a song that we used to sing in the celebration service. But it talks about no matter where you are, wherever God finds you, that his mighty love and his mighty grace is there to save us. So stand wherever you are in body or spirit and let us sing together.
And so we have an invitation to you this week. It's time for us to put down the stones that we are so ready to cast at one another and to pick up the cross. And so we invite you to make sure that you've registered today because we'll be sending a cross to all of you this week. A cross that's just a reminder that we follow a risen Savior who is mighty to save. A Savior who invites us to lay down the stones and instead reach out to one another in love. It's been wonderful to be together this morning. I hope that you have a great week. Spend some time reading the Gospel of John this week. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you on Wednesday night as we have some gospel talk live at 8.30 p.m. Uh, I hope it is a wonderful week, and I hope that wherever life takes you this week, you find your way back on to Grace Avenue. As you go forth today, go forth with the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.